I'd just like to do a brief recapitulation of uh, what we have been speaking of because there are a number here that um, you know have not heard this series. The series is being watched, and uh, I just want to say that. Uh, there are uh, basically two areas of scripture we're looking at at the moment. And the first is Isaiah chapter 4. We've been looking at that. And uh, Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 3. It shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion... And God has been quickening that to me. That there has been a purging of people in our congregations. And not only our congregations, but others too are experiencing it. And God is saying, well... To some, you were given the opportunity for many years to change, but you haven't changed. And uh, God is taking them out. And that has ever been his um, procedures, if I could say this. You know, when Charles Finney had those great revivals just north of here, he went with a heavy heart and also a joyful heart when God indicated uh, the church to which he should minister. He said, with a heavy heart, because he said, I knew that some who had been churchgoers for a long, long time when revival came, they would leave because they had not met God in their own hearts and therefore would not accept. And then uh, he said, with a joyful heart, because many would come in. But that little phrase, those that are left in Zion, we want to be among those that are left in Zion. And uh, what happens to them? Well, in verse 4 of Isaiah 4, they are washed from their filth. It's they who remain experience the washing. And that has been our theme, washing. And then comes the spirit of judgment, spirit of burning, ending up with fire and glory that we're looking for. Well, I want to turn with you now to a little phrase in Ezekiel chapter 16, please. Ezekiel chapter 16 little phrase that sort of jumped out to me as I was studying this. Actually, uh, the segment that we're looking at is washing in the Old Testament the prophets. And uh, we see it in Isaiah 4, but I want you to look with me in uh, 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 Ezekiel chapter 16 please Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 4 I'll just give you a moment to um, find that little uh, verse because uh, it's going to form the shall I say the um, kernel of our theme this morning and uh, here in uh, Ezekiel 16 verse 4 
it's speaking, of course, of Jerusalem. And uh, he's likening Jerusalem to a little baby girl who was rejected, left out in the wilderness to die, and he had compassion upon, as it were, this little baby girl, which in reality was Jerusalem. And uh, I just want to bring out in uh, verse 4, washed in water to supple thee. Washed in water to supple thee. Here is another, shall I say, usage of water that uh, when a newborn comes into the uh, world, it's washed, you know, to supple its skin and so forth. And so it's on that that I want to speak. Now, uh, I want to look at leather as a type of, uh, shall I say, the Christian, leather. And uh, leather, you see, has to undergo washing to make it supple. And we are like leather because we have to be made supple. Now the world's best leather comes actually from Florentine in the uh, Bale or province of Tuscany in Italy. And I think we all know the name of the uh, firm that's preeminent, Gucci. And uh, I think uh, many are the ladies who uh, would desire to have uh, products from this world-famous firm. It's a whole business, actually. And it started in 1410. But uh, that leather that is used for perhaps handbags, for perhaps shoes, comes from the hides of this cattle that is confined to this valley. And uh, the best hides came from cattle that it was not allowed to leave its pen for fear of being scratched. And in that we have a spiritual, shall I say, uh, story. And of course, Malachi speaks of ye shall grow up like calves in a stall. Because that cattle grew very quickly. It couldn't use its strength to go out into the fields, it was fed very carefully. And uh, the best uh, hide or the best leather came from the veal and uh, that was fed from the lush valley of uh, Kiana. Now then, The washing process, having uh, got the leather, got the hide, there was a washing process. And uh, to make that leather soft, smooth, 
and supple. And all these have spiritual significations. Well, what is the definition of supple? Well, it's interesting. It's capable of being bent without creases, cracks, or breaks. And there's a picture of a Christian capable of being bent but does not have creases to show after it or cracks or breaks. God wants us to be supple and the suppleness is achieved in the, uh, shall I say, the pens and stalls of the Gucci uh, family by water as well as other things. And water speaks of the word of God. And so uh, I want to uh, look at some of these things that we have brought out from a spiritual point of view. Now, it speaks in Malachi and the best hide in the Gucci family is from cattle that has not been allowed to leave its pen or stalls for fear of being scratched. But you know, as I was meditating upon this, you know, you think of Joseph, you think of Paul, how many times they had to be confined they had to experience confinement. And there was a purpose behind that. That they would not be subjected to certain things that could scratch them. They were being made supple. They were being made supple. The word of God was trying Joseph the promises that God had made to him were being ever before him. Was he going to believe those promises that God had said that one day he would rule over his brethren? Or was he going to reject them and say, no, I don't believe them, but no, he believed what God had said. And you know, we have to go through places like that. You know, in a certain sense, when students come here, they experience a certain confinement. Some embrace this confinement with a holy contentment and others kick up their heels. But... Uh, I have noticed in life, and of course I've had a long one already, that uh, throughout life, that if we submit to God, we shall experience the pen and the uh, stall experience of Malachi chapter 4. Thou shalt grow up as calves in the stall. In other words, you've got to be confined to be made supple. The word of God has got to, shall I say, work within you. So let's have a look at the, uh, shall I say, the spiritual aspect of the, the word of God washing us and making us supple. Basically, we are a tripartite uh, being. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. And all th three must be supple. 
You know, the spirit. I'm going to say that the spirit reflects our will. Our will must be supple. You know, uh, I'm experiencing that day by day. You know, perhaps I want to do something, but perhaps it's not possible. What is my action or reaction going to be? Am I going to accept it or am I going to rebel against circumstances? No, I must accept it. And uh, I have found that things start to work within me. They never worked before when I've started to adopt these attitudes. Our will, you know... How many people, you know, get upset because they want to do one thing and circumstances prevent them and they lose their victory, they become out of sorts, they became objectionable to those around them. No, no. Our will must be subjected to the word of God in order that in that area of our life we must be supple. You see, and coming back to the definition of supple, you know, we can be bent in one way, but we must not crack. We must not break. We must not even have creases that reflect the battle we've gone through. And then uh, there is our soul. Well, the soul is the seat of emotions. And uh, that soul has to have the word of God washing it what is the problem with our soul well shall I say the antidote is Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11 where the apostle Paul said I have learnt that in whatsoever state I am thereby to be content content you know, we have to have that holy contentment that whatever happens, we are content. But you notice it says, I have learnt. It doesn't come overnight. But I have learnt. I have learnt. That it doesn't matter whatsoever state I'm in. You know, I am going to be Content. I'm going to be content. Contentment. Holy contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And so we've got to let the word of God teach us, minister to our souls, that indeed we come to that place it doesn't matter in what situation we're in, we're content. And then, of course, there is the body. And uh, that has to be washed indeed. And I was thinking, uh, you know, how to bring this out. But and this little scripture came to me, you know, whatsoever is put before they eat. In other words, we have to accept the situation, accept the fear that is put before us. We must triumph in that area. 
We must be supple in all those aspects of life. Supple. That's one of the ministries of the Lord to his people to wash them, to make them supple. To make them supple. And, uh, you know, if you ever go by uh, Fifth Avenue or somewhere where Gucci uh, family have their display, you can look upon the finest of the leather in the world, but it's gone through a process. And uh, basically, you know, uh, good leather starts with good food. <laughs> Spiritual food. And uh, in Psalm 81 and verse 16, it said we were fed on the finest of the wheat. You know, a calf has to be well fed in order to produce the leather that the Gucci family are looking for. They have to be fed on this lush grass from this particular valley in Tuscany. And in the same way, we have to be fed with the finest of God's word so that when our time of washing comes, well, we've got good leather. <laughs> See, it starts with good food. And so we, we must study the word of God. We must ensure that we are fed on the finest of the wheat and if we're a teacher or a pastor then we've got to feed our people on the finest of the wheat because that's the only way that you're going to enable God to bring them to this state of simplicity. I don't know if that word exists but it's a new one now but anyway uh, supple supple and so I want you to meditate on this you know we're studying washing but we often think well washing is just cleansing us no there is this area of the ministry of the washing of the word to make us supple that we can be bent in any direction and we spring back without any creases, cracks. See, that's, that's what God wants us to be supple. And then I, I want to continue um, in uh, Ezekiel 16 and uh, in Ezekiel 16 it speaks of God doing this work and then clothing clothing this young lady shall I say with all kinds of beautiful garments and I just want to pick up on one or two of the garments it speaks of the finest of the linen. Well, we've heard prophecy now concerning righteousness. And uh, linen speaks of righteousness. And we want to be clothed upon with his righteousness, not ours. And then... Uh, Another thing that God wants to clothe us with is silk. 
And silk basically is uh, the epitome of beauty, of beauty. He wants to clothe us upon with his beauty. And then uh, it's interesting. He puts bracelets on the arms or wrists of this young lady in Ezekiel 16. Well, what are bracelets? Well, basically, bracelets speak of covenant relationship. And uh, he has mentioned that already. You know, you are in covenant relationship with me. And, and we want to have, you know, our wrists garnered with those bracelets. We want to be in covenant relationship with God. Whereby the covenants of David, the covenants of Abraham have been given to us personally. We are in covenant relationship with God. The queen, you know, the coronation had bracelets put upon her. She was in covenant relationship with her people. And then uh, something else. A chain put around the neck. Well, where do we see that in the word of God? And that, of course, is in the life of Daniel, where Daniel is made the third ruler of the kingdom because Belshazzar was the second and his father who was away was the first and a chain was put around his neck and a chain speaks of authority authority position if you like and we want to have the chain of God around our necks having the authority of the kingdom when we speak or when we act and then uh, there's something else the feet are shod with badger skins well you know, what do we know about the feet? In Ephesians chapter 6, the feet are shod with the gospel of peace. In Isaiah, you know how beautiful are the feet of those upon the mountain who cry out, Thy God reigneth. And we want to have our feet shod with the gospel, with the message, so that we are, if I could say that, messengers of hope. Messengers of hope. Well, there we are. Now is that where it finishes in Ezekiel 16? Well, I wish to God it did finish there, but it doesn't finish there because there's always a danger that when one is blessed of God, one relies upon that blessing. One relies upon one's own, shall I say, strength and so forth. No, there was a real problem that surface now. It's a problem that flows through the word of God. Somehow, 
And I think Mark Twain brought it out very well indeed. He said, you don't really know a man when he's in adversity. But you will know the heart of a man when he has been elevated to a position of authority and trust. And I believe he was right. Because as we look into the word of God, we find certain people that were elevated, but uh, it destroyed them, or well nigh destroyed them. You know, King David, he had uh, been successful in battle and so forth. And he felt, well, there was no necessity for him to go out now and fight. But in remaining behind, he was well nigh destroyed by Bathsheba. I look into the newspaper and I see time and time again I see people who have reached prominence in political life in various aspects of life and they lose it all because they do not control their boundaries and they think that because they have been elevated to this position they are not under the law very much like Hezekiah Hezekiah you see when he had been blessed with that wonderful healing and people from all nations were coming to him and congratulating him. It was almost too much for him and too much for Jerusalem. They couldn't contain it. And as they were lifted up, well, their heart was lifted up in pride. And they were an abomination to God. Mercifully, they repented. But you see, the greatest of them all was Satan. You know, it says in Ezekiel 16 and verse 15, and also another reference in uh, Ezekiel 27 verse 3, and another reference in Ezekiel 28 and verse 17. You know, it must have been that Satan looked at himself and his heart was lifted up because of his beauty. One of the great dangers I've seen in life and somehow they've come to me at this moment from all aspects politics and so forth that people have been lifted up and they think there are no boundaries for them and we have got to be very careful beloved that when God meets with us and blesses us you know, we will not trust in our own beauty. Or our heart be lifted up because of what God has done for us. Well, Satan could not 
overcome the blessings that God had given to him. Hezekiah, it was too much for him. King David, too much for him. You know, they think that when they've been lifted up, they're different. And uh, I have met uh, many, uh, shall I say, influential leaders in the Christian world. And uh, they didn't keep the boundaries. And what did they say? I said, well, did you think you were going to get away with it? And they said, we thought God would understand. And that with us it was different. I said, well, God is no respecter of persons. You see, no. No, let us remember this. That Ezekiel 16 finishes tragically. After all the wonderful work that God does in this young lady, you know, and washes her and she becomes supple. Oh, isn't it beautiful to see a supple woman? Will you do this? Will you do that? Oh, yes, yes. Can I do this for you? Can I do that for you? You know, no thought of crossing their will. Many, I have believed that even amongst us have attained or are attaining to this position of being supple. It's very beautiful, very beautiful to see. Yes, but we've got to be careful that when God blesses, you know, we do not see ourselves in a different situation as to others.